It's going out there. It's February 10th. I'm Frank Curtis. It's the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast, where I break down the headlines. And, uh, Tell you what's really moving these markets. It's Thursday. Have an incredible guest for you. The handsome, great fisherman. I don't know. I keep going and going and going here. I don't know if I want to go too much further. Andrew Horowitz, founder and president of Horowitz and Company Money Management, host of Discipline Investor Podcast. And if you are watching on our YouTube and watching the video, someone who looks very, very sharp and looks like you lost some weight, buddy. You look great. Thanks. Working hard on it, sir. I wanted to do it all because, uh, you know, of course, you asked me a couple of months ago that we got to do a show again. And I figured, you know what? I better look good for your audience. <laughs> uh, and you're also host of Display Investor Podcast. But but how, how did you lose the weight? Because someone that was, you know, who lost the weight, I, I don't – people say, how'd you do it? And I think it's kind of funny because it's kind of easy, you know, just – you can't eat anything yeah, that you it, like it, anymore. <laughs> well, you know it's interesting because uh, I was I was eating what I thought was light, which it is. You know, I'd eat proteins and salads and things of that mm. nature. Of course, on the weekends, <laughs> taking down a lot of whiskey, fireballs, all that good stuff, right? Mm. And uh, then switching over to like whites, so like vodkas and you know some wines. And then I was running, kind of jogging every day. You know, nothing mm. crazy, but uh, doing that. And I'm like, I cannot lose weight. So I decided on January 1st, okay, listen, let's just see if there's a a dysfunction with my body or something. I just pretty much cut out food and it's worked pretty well. So uh, <laughs> so instead of three eggs in the morning for an omelet or you know something else, I don't have any – I've really cut out carbohydrates. That's the trick. Let's be honest. Cutting out it's, carbohydrates. It's bread, really. It, it's carbs. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. carbs. That's, that's it. Because even when you eat carbs, you'll see you'll gain like five pounds, like like that. And you become right. bloated because your body just can't break it down. But, you know, listen, if you can eat salad, you can cheat sometimes. and you can, But it's there's really no formula. There's a million different diets. But, man, that, that's that's right. the key. If you want to lose weight, it's really focused on the carbs. I agree with you. Cause that's, oh, totally. And, and totally. I love that. I love carbs. I'm Italian. Yep. Oh, that pasta and everything. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get the important stuff here because, uh, you know, you and I always talk and, and before we come on each other's podcast, I was on yours a couple of weeks ago, where I was like, hey, send some topics that you like to talk about. And, you know, we'd have little bullets and some of them we get to, some we don't. But one of the things I noticed with the bullets that you sent, it sounded like you were really pissed off at a lot of things, especially the Fed. <laughs> Fed up with the Fed. Full of you know what. Yeah. They have no clue. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? Because we see that they have no clue where people – it went from three rate hikes to four rate hikes to now five, six, seven we're hearing. And you're seeing yeah. you know, Goldman Sachs just raised uh, you know, the 10-year forecast from two to two and a quarter. I mean you know, just everyone keeps raising and raising and raising, and yet we're still waiting for the Fed to actually start doing something. But you know, what are your thoughts there? So first of all, obviously, I have a significant amount of hunger going on right now because I'm not eating. So it makes me even more angry, right? <laughs> so my anger for the Fed, and, and obviously Fed is like feed. So the whole thing about food, it's just not there. But the Fed is full of crap. Let's be honest about this. The fact is that they're one of the worst forecasters out there. They talk, Just look at recent history to know this. It's all about their inability to really do anything to – um, provide good guidance other than the fact that they are using their, their their calculated methodology for providing information to try to provide confidence for the market. So example would be, and the problem they have right now, is when just a few months ago, they were talking about transitory inflation. We all knew that was not the case. We all knew that inflation was not transitory. It was here for a while. And in fact, the whole misnomer about once inflation drops, maybe prices will drop. No, there's going to be a very sticky uh, amount of, of price hikes across the board. Well, now all of a sudden they pivot and they're freaking out because they're just, it seems like amateurs. Oh my God, we're going to have inflation now forever. So they go from inflation is going to be here for a couple of months to their inability to project where it's going to be now to be here that inflation is going to be here forever. So the markets freak out along the way. For some reason, the markets still think that the Fed uh, has the ability to really know what's going on. The only thing the Fed has and why the market should follow along what they say is because they have the power to add liquidity, take away liquidity, to increase rates, et cetera. So what I think right now, and, and Raphael Bostic talked about it just yesterday, was the idea that, you know, probably about three rate increases seems about right to get us through where we need to be. Whether or not inflation, in fact, is going to be a, a problem longer term, because the disruption to the markets, the inability for higher rates to, um, or the ability for the higher rates to really cut down 
on growth and to be a major point of problem for government paying off debt and, and loan service, debt service. It, it, it's just, it, I can't see it happening. Already, I'll finish on this one point, just the commentary, the pivot, the discussion from the Fed about potentially raising rates and about bringing down the balance sheet or at least stopping the quantitative easing, possibly going into quantitative tightening, has already tightened financial conditions significantly. You know, Andrew, it's funny because we're used to saying over the past 10, 12 years, because the Fed and even on fiscal side, our politicians throw money at every single problem we have. This is the one problem they can't throw money at. So even when right. you say, you know, when you're saying, well, I don't see it going to this or I don't see the Fed. I think the Fed is backed up into a corner here for the first time in a very, very long time. I, we haven't seen inflation every pressures, and we changed the way the CPI is calculated. Right. I think it's 13 times in the past 30 years. So they're saying that inflation, right. if it was calculated the same way in the 80s, would be even higher with double-digit inflation. They're saying, well, it's 7%. And But let's look at it from a personal point of view, right? We have you know different companies. We're seeing these companies come out. They're reporting earnings. And you reportedly had good numbers. But you know the costs are rising across the board. The way- yeah. That, right. you know, climate change policy is, hey, let's go to, and again, I don't care what side you're on, if you believe it or not, but, you know, you're saying we need to go to alternatives, so let's, and renewables, so let's, you know, we have to stop drilling, but well, we don't have those replacements. So now we have energy skyrocketing, natural gas skyrocketing, skyrocketing so much you're seeing coal go through the roof because, you know, electricity right. companies are like, I'm not using natural gas, it's through the roof, let's go back to coal, right? Even France said they're going back to coal, right, for, for, right now, right. in China. Extending it's supposed to be you know zero carbon emissions twenty twenty five. Well, let's go push it out to twenty thirty, right? So, yeah, you yeah, see all these negative effects. Uh, how does this end? Because it's either you're going to result in in people stop paying these higher prices, where you can only raise prices certain amount. Some of them have had pricing power because everyone's been giving checks. Now you're turning off that faucet. But we're seeing a lot of companies say, look, there's inflationary pressures. Our costs are higher. We're okay to pass on those costs. But what happens once the consumer is like, okay? We're seeing much higher rates. Our portfolios are down now because, you know, maybe a little aggressive with a lot of stocks. But, you know, that's going to change the outlook. But how does inflation slow down without the Fed actually being aggressive here and going more than three rate hikes? You know, they say that uh, the only thing that doesn't corrode salt water is salt water. OK, <laughs> the fact is the only thing that will uh, provide uh, uh, a, a cure for inflation is higher prices. And the fact is that when we look at the 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 run of on food issues, on uh, supply chain uh, cost factors, when we see uh, clothing, energy prices, I mean, name it, everything across the board, right? I mean, lumber prices are back going up again. Mm -hmm. We're seeing all this happen in, in, in real time and almost to this fascinating degree of, oh, my gosh, how could it be moving there? Oil's going to be 100. Who who Where is that coming from, right? When just a few days ago, it seemed it was negative 40. So <laughs> I think that the higher prices, though, will, in fact, start slowing things down. There's a limit. There's, there's, a, there's a ceiling to where people can spend and are willing to spend. And that will be a natural process of leveling off the prices over time. And, and if the Fed's not careful, what's going to happen is they're going to do what they did before. What they did before, which was a big policy mistake, is they kept rates too low for too long with mm -hmm. massive stimulus coming out. Now that the stimulus is being withdrawn, savings rates are dropping significantly, prices are going higher. If they start really poking that too hard, they're going to cause a major downside move and they're going to cause a recession, which is, by the way, what they do all the time. They let it go on for too long, then they pop the bubble, and then it turns into a disaster. And they're like, oh, we thought we cured the economic curve. You know, we thought we were never going to have these cycles anymore. But wonderful uh, Fed and their way they do things is just the same thing mm. over and over again. Um, they, they work from a very scared and a very um, slow process. But the, the pricing factors that you're seeing right now, I totally agree. I, mean, I'm, I, I was talking about this months ago. Mm. I'm the one said that the Fed was full of crap back then about the transitory. But I think they're a little bit wrong with the fact that there's going to be, well, with a caveat, if we see some of the supply chain issues resolve if if mm -hmm. if we see the ports open in china if you know there's a lot of ifs there uh we could see that there would be an opportunity but you know markets are are efficient they'll look for other alternatives cheaper ways of doing things you can't put up with wage increases like this because companies know it's mm -hmm. very sticky and you're seeing those wage increase that's why the fed really scared here so and a lot of yeah. the investment banks too right i mean that that it's not just price of commodities but just the wage hikes but you, you, you 
was so in tune with a recession where it's yes or no, where recession is defined by two straight quarters of negative GDP. Yet, if right. we see GDP go from seven, eight percent, which you know it's a very, very high considering we're coming off of, uh, of COVID, which you know is negative, but we see you know zero point one gain, zero point one gain for two quarters. It's not a recession, but when you're looking at certain industries, aren't we in a recession here? I mean, look, it, now? it's amazing to see moves like Facebook and then on the next day be so nervous that you see Amazon go up seventeen percent. We're talking about two hundred and fifty billion dollar market cap move right. in two stocks, which there's only twenty four companies SP five hundred that have greater market caps than two hundred and fifty billion. Those stocks move that much in a day, right? In, in consecutive right. The days. greatest drop in any one day of market cap, followed by the greatest increase in market cap of any company the next day. Is that a sign of the is that telling you that it's a stock picker's market or is it telling you that this is a sign of the times because excuse my language, shit like this doesn't happen in normal markets. Uh, I think it's amateur hour, total amateur hour out there. I mean, look at what happened when fa this particular issue, Facebook, and, I, and I, I hear you about the drop, and maybe Facebook was overdone. I never really was a big fan of Facebook. We don't hold it in our trading portfolios. A couple of clients have it because they want to have it. They have like a cost basis of two, you know, so mm -hmm. we're not really selling that for them. But other than that, it's not like a position we're putting on or want to put on. Never really liked the company uh, for years and was wrong about that, but there's plenty of alternatives we had that did just fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is when Facebook dropped 20% that day, what else happened? Snap, which was reporting the next day, was down 25% mm -hmm. in sympathy. Why? Because there was a big concern that the Apple privacy issues, the, the shutdown mm -hmm. of some of the flow through information mm -hmm. was going to be flow through. What happened when Snap came out with the first positive quarter ever <laughs> on record, stocks up 60%. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of lean on uh, the, the area of um, of the short side, of the long side. People are getting offsided by a lot of things. And I think that's a big issue right now with the markets. And then once again, we saw people get very offsided and push into the shorts. Look what's been happening over the last, I don't know, week and a half, ever since really um, since Google and Microsoft provide an update. I mean, things have been a little bit more towards the, the bid side, don't you think? It has been, but I, you know, for me, when I look, maybe, you know, Facebook wasn't lying that they said that this was going to impact them, those Apple changes to privacy, but they said it for three quarters and they still put up good numbers. Then you go into right. the move for Meta, which is a massive change, even change your name, right, for the metaverse. And then you talk right. about TikTok being a risk. So now people are like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Did you really see this coming? Because, and it's a reflection of not a change in business, but it's a change where, when you're in advertising, you can see every single piece of data. You're going right. to, yeah, you have pricing power, right? And Facebook, you know exactly where these people are, where they are at a store at that moment, right? right? It's, it's unbelievable. But what happened? You saw money come off of that platform. So it's not an industry concern because look at Google's numbers who blew them out. So obviously the advertising came off of that because they can't see the data because of those policies. Right. When now Google has free reign to follow you wherever the hell you want. And you saw that in the results. To me, it kind of tells you it's, it's a stock picker's market here. Uh, but, you know, I agree. Snap I totally agree. Back as well. Snap bounced back. What was right. it? 55% went up the next day, right? Yep. Crazy. Yep. And the one one day. I agree with you 100%. I think that that for too long, it's been this passive market that people just say, eh, mm -hmm. let's just throw it into an index fund. And what happened is it was a self fulfilling prophecy. What happened is you put the money in. What were you buying? Well, 20% was the top stocks. And those would just go up no matter what. And you kept on dollar cost averaging in the pensions, the 401ks, the hedge funds. Let's just put it in there. And Facebook's numbers weren't so bad. It was their outlook that was a real problem. And it was the communication about their numbers and outlook with the analysts who really screwed it up. I think there were three analysts that had either sell or hold mm -hmm. on Facebook. The rest of them were all buys with much higher price targets. So mm -hmm. there was a miscommunication there and I think that was a, a big problem. But when you look at Microsoft, you look at Google, Netflix aside, there was a problem there. But you look at um, Amazon, Apple. just terrific numbers. Yeah, Apple too. Amazon had the Rivian numbers in there. Amazon also did good with AWS. Amazon had a few other things that were, mm -hmm. you know, iffy. They did raise their uh, price for the Prime, which I'll mm -hmm. gladly play, pay any day. Everybody, I'll pay double that. that. Oh, I'll pay too, double. No <laughs> I have no idea that, how they do it. How do they get? How do you order? I'm not talking about ordering something you get in the store. You could order something random. And how do they get it to your house in one day? I, like that, I, I don't even know. Sometimes I think of stuff and it shows up. I'm like, how yeah, does that I, work? You know, <laughs> they, they are amazing. They are amazing. I got it. Listen, you can hate them, whatever, but they are amazing. It's just wow, it is yep. incredible. And, and they did a good job. I, I love when companies do this. Last quarter, 
I always see this. When you see expenses go up, that scares the hell out of Wall Street. You see the stock come down. When you yep. look at why expenses went up, they said, we have to pay our employees more. I love that because you're in the industry yeah. where you need to make sure those – there's a lot of choices out there. There's a lot of competition out there. Yep. You know that ensures that okay, we're not going to have a problem with, on this front when a lot of people may maybe at the WalMarts or the Targets and stuff. And, and I love that. And then you see it one quarter later. You know, it's not a coincidence to see these numbers really, really take off. And man, the right. trend just looks like it's going to go a lot higher. It seems like a, a dirt cheap stock here now. Another thing that you sent me that you seem pretty pissed off about was, was SPACs. And uh -oh. This is something that I've been going crazy on because <laughs> the amount of money and breaking it down and what these guys do and how they – its all this all happens because you have uh, an enthusiastic retail the, investor yeah. willing to buy this crap at 10, 13, 15, 17, and these guys promote it. And they're selling it to you who are in a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, even, even you know much lower than that with free warrants. They don't have to disclose. You're yep. seeing this industry really start to disappear Uh you know, what's your thoughts? Because I know you're as mad as I am, and I, I love you know that little bullet you were like. Um, you know, some yeah. of the first Just, of all, we paint a, a, a very a very wide and a very dense brush when we talk about SPACs, right? The special yeah. purpose acquisition companies that are the old reverse mergers where they do a pipe, which is a public private deal. They put it together, they promote it with a one pager. Chamath Palihapitiya, the SPAC Barker, what an idiot! I mean, no, I shouldn't say that. I take it back. He's brilliant. Really actually, smart yeah. guy. Yeah, really smart guy. I'm money. sorry I he said that. I, that was the wrong word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He needs how to I make money on the backs of retail and make it look like he's doing you a favor. Yes. So the truth is that these deals came up. There were some really interesting ones. I bought a few of these personally and for portfolios. Did really well in the early days. I mean, big numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Then they all started to come down and cave in. There's still some good ones out there. There could be good companies out yeah. there that are involved in this. The problem is the transparency, the, the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that when there's a time when you can come out and come to the market and say, we do not have a necessarily a path to profitability. That was a big thing that we heard, right? The path to profitability. And they chart, to start putting a, a, a napkin drawing, oh, this is how we're going to make money doing this. Or my favorites, they're going to take an industry that needs to be disrupted that really doesn't need to be disrupted and mm -hmm. says, well, if we just make an app out of it, it will be worth billions. Like, really? Stamp collecting on an app is worth billions? How is that? I don't understand. Yeah. So so what we have is that many companies, the very basic nature of them was a problem. They got a lot of names behind them. And look at what's going on in crypto world. Look what's going on in some of these others. They had a lot of celebs behind them, right? They had a lot of athletes behind them. Everybody's like, Robin yeah, Hood. I want to get into that. Robin Hood Who? had Jared Leto and I looked yep. at this Jared Leto and also Snoop Dogg invest in that company at a $13 million valuation. So they were up like a hundred thousand percent even at today's price, which the stock is down fifty percent off of its IPO. That's when right. you want to get in. Unfortunately, you're not gonna get in as a retail investor. They They're gonna <laughs> sell this thing to you at 12, 13, 15, whatever it is. And, and even for Robin Hood's case, would it come out at 36, 37, 38 billion dollar valuation? Right. These guys went at 13 million dollar valuation. Incredible. You're right. And the problem is that since when do we follow athletes into any investment? <laughs> Listen, uh, we're not talking about uh, we're talking about the masses, right? And that's what we've seen with the with the correct. Reddit crowd. And that's and we were like, ah, it's not a big deal, it's not a lot of money until yeah, you, know, you saw that that Dow thing when when what was it the uh, the Constitution? These kids together raised forty five million dollars. Forty five million. They the are massive, massive yeah. amount. Now they're like, wow, let's just target these people because they're not they're gonna buy stuff and not even look at a number. They're just gonna say, Frank, hey, AMC I gotta tell you great. something, Frank. I gotta tell you something. This yeah, is important. I want everybody to focus on what I'm about to talk about because we talked about this on a podcast. I think two podcasts on, on the mm -hmm. disciplined mm -hmm. investor uh, a couple weeks ago. They didn't care about their money. Do you know why? Because it came free. They mm -hmm. didn't care about what they invested in. They didn't care about the price, the fundamentals. They didn't care about anything more than the intent of, of hopefully making some money, having some fun at doing it. It was chips at a casino with no value. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. You don't care about your money. In the end, your money's not going to care about you. I know that's kind of, you know, this, 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 this concept like, oh, well, that makes mm -hmm. sense. But think about it. That's exactly what happened. And that's why this blew up to a point. Look at any chart and you see these crazy moves on the upside. And then the downside is just as crazy. Yeah. There's a it lot of them crazy. out there. There is. And, you know, they just, it's a way of taking advantage. And, 
you know, I wanted to, to move on to talk about some of your ideas, which I love to do. And you always throw some of them out there. And you mentioned Roblox and Paramount was another one. But, but you know, just Roblox is a name that I've been wrong on, but I, I like it because it is up and running metaverse platform. Nike signed with them. Yep. This isn't like Rivian. This is a company that's generating billions <clears throat> of dollars in sales. Yes, came out at a pretty high valuation. But, you know, to me, the future of the metaverse, I mean, this is the company that everyone can sign up to now where Facebook has right. to do their own thing internally with their own people. But this is like the avenue that I think if anyone wants to go, this is what they do. And, you know, my daughters are on this platform. They love it, have safety measures in there. I mean, this is a, a really good company and, and that that's growing. I'm just to see it really crash along with the Rivians and all the other companies that, you know, have yeah. crazy, super crazy valuations. I, I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised too. I mean, I like the company. We own it. And I think that there is um, an opportunity here if, in fact, there is a metaverse in the future, if, in fact, just simply kids want to learn how to code and code gaming, right? That's a big issue with Roblox. And the fact that they are earning money, they would, and they're, 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 they're earning money in terms of uh, revenue. They're losing money, let's be honest. Uh, but that could turn around very, very quickly for them once they stop the expansion. The opportunity for other players, whether it's the NFTs that they're going to bring on board, the payment processing of, of things in the metaverse, the games, um, the, 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 the land ownership, the, the, the buying of um, places and utilizing the um, functions of, of of shoes and clothing and gas stations and cars and games. And if it does take off and there is something to be said about it, they are very well situated. I think as the number one player in that pole position. No, I like and another company you mentioned it where you're talking about is the, the streaming companies, right? We look at you see a big difference. I think Netflix. I mean, a lot of companies don't even let you binge, right? They have to, they're coming out oh, you know, after the week, but you terrible. Know, have Paramount, NBC, you lose, you know, who's going to lose NBC content? You have all the, I've never seen so many companies jump into a business model where it's almost impossible to make money off of it, other than Netflix. Yeah. But Netflix was in debt for, you know, 15 years before they made this happen and spends 30, 35 billion dollars a year on new content. You know, all these guys with libraries think, oh, we'll just start this platform. It's You can't start it just with content. People care about new content, right? And I think Disney's right. learning that the hard right. way. But, you know, right. even Paramount, Paramount will as about, well. Yeah, Paramount. Yeah, But talk about that. I mean, is there any value to, to these? Because a lot of these companies continue to lose, you know, billions and billions of dollars. They have one show, two shows. Let me explain something. Let me ask you a question first, Frank. If you put Paramount Plus and Disney Plus and Netflix and Hulu together with ESPN, what do you get? Cable. Pretty much, I mean, yeah. That's, we, we have cable deconstructed. Now we're yeah. going to pay more. The whole yeah, idea was to do a skinny service. bundle over the top, you know, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you have and, to have a lot of pay more on your news and sports and stuff. You know, It's, you, you know, it's the stupidest ESPN. thing I've ever seen in my life. It's this whole idea of young people and people thought, hey, we could do this better. They screwed it up royally. I mean, yeah, you know, for a long time, it was great you had basic cable with some HBO, Showtime, movie channel, and he added a Netflix and maybe a Hulu, right? That was the whole deal. Now you got to buy all these different components. And when I watch 1883, which is the precursor to a wonderful series called Yellowstone, mm -hmm. which has the debate about chili with beans or not, meat or not, but 1883, if you take half of it and look at it, it's just people wandering and looking off into space looking into the fields. Half of it is just gazing at cattle. I'm like, I feel like I'm watching a Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. they have I, the contents, I, it's, it's average at best. I heard, I signed up to, to Paramount. I have Disney and because I got it for free, uh, which I'll have it free for life, they said, because I have uh, Verizon, oh. which is amazing. That's where oh, I think about nice. probably 60 to 70% of their customers, I would guess, are for free. That's why the average cost per re revenue per user is like four bucks, right? Compared to right. Netflix, so much higher. But uh, you know, everybody wanted to see more subscribers. They didn't care if anyone was paying for that. That's what was good. Correct. Publicity. But now you called that. You called that great. Yeah, those numbers yeah. actually mean something now, right? But yeah, so I signed up to Paramount and and I you know, wanted to watch Yellowstone and it, it didn't work, right? So I put in the password, you sign up, it didn't work. Then I tried on my phone, I tried to to you know mirror it to my TV through the Apple TV. That didn't work. And I'm like, why is this so difficult? I'm pretty tech savvy, but I was just surprised that, you know, why is it so difficult when everything else was easy in terms of, of you know, Disney Plus and, and having all these other services uh, and even Prime. But, you know, it just goes to show you that not all these are created equal. And even even so, and you, you're looking at these, there's just so much competition right. in this space that I just yep. not, 
Netflix is so is light years ahead of everybody else. They really are. And, oh yeah. And starting to show the amount of money that these companies have to spend for new content when they just could sit back and everyone's in dire need of content. You could license this stuff out and make money doing nothing. Instead, you want right. to create the platform. Create. I don't know. I just don't get it. And it, it, it's going to come back to bite a lot of these companies. They yes, it's already starting. I mean, the Paramount Plus and everybody. I know a few people that are all shocked about Viacom after that major debacle. I think they're just buying because it's low. I, I don't understand the business model of this Paramount Plus and this whole fact that you just put all your old junk on there, make it look like it's something with a terrible interface, by the way, and then at the same time just put a couple of new shows. Then do what everybody hates, which is put one out per week. I hate the it. The whole idea of the streaming yeah. service was the binging. Yes. Was was put it out there and let people just Ozarks, absorb it throughout the whole thing. Yes, Kobe yeah, Kai, throughout the whole thing. That's what we want to see. Whole thing, just go through it. You know, it's that's, that's what we love. <laughs> and we and we stay in a platform, right. but that doesn't work for them. It, now let's get to some some other ideas. Uh, I know you're saying valuation, uh, you know, is great outside the U.S. I've heard this argument for twelve years, and the U.S. is always one of the best place at to least. invest. At least, I mean, right. even since the credit crisis, it's cheaper, 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 cheaper. Should invest in Russia, should invest in Europe, should invest in all this stuff. And the U.S. outperform every single time outside what you could probably pick a period of three to nine months or whatever your own period. But yeah. it's better off staying in the U.S. Why, you know, I know you said that that you're excited. You know, better valuations. China is stimulating compared to us, which we're tightening. Uh, you know, what are you seeing there? Do you have any ideas to share? And, and is it like on the international front? So I totally agree with you that uh, it has been a better valuation play for many, many years. That is a truth. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's a better returning investment <laughs> over that period exactly. of time. It's <laughs> exactly. a better valuation play, which therefore leads you down the path of if it's a better valuation that maybe during rough times it will act as a nice buffer. That also has not necessarily played out exactly right. But I do like the idea that and it's probably a, um, a, 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 a minimal uh, view a point of many people, and it's a smaller um, majority of people that would think this, that, you know, China, for all of the bad things that are going on, they are stimulating their economy. And that is something significant. I found that in the past when they were tightening and we're a few months down the road and we start tightening and then they start loosening up again, it's oftentimes a pretty interesting time there. If you look at something like the K-Web, K-W-E-B, which is the China internet uh, you know, all the Alaba Alibabas and and, and various um, internet players out there, they they drop significantly. I mean, mightily over the last year. There's some uh, bottom picking that could be going on right now for a really good opportunity. I think that also you look at EM, the one caveat to EM, emerging markets, is that you have to be careful because if the dollar does in fact move up very dramatically, if with the fact that the Fed is going to be in an aggressive rate tight tightening mode, that could play havoc to what we see inside of emerging markets. There's there's uh, various ways to do that through either ETFs, through um, uh, through through mutual funds. What are we looking at here? What this is that? Is K Web. This is like this would be oh, the yeah. greatest chart in the world if it was like upside down. Upside down. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's yeah, no, it's I did, yeah, uh, all the way on the other end. This is a, you know, if you watch it on, on a YouTube page, I have the chart up here. A lot of you listen to your iTunes, but uh, all the way on the left side, a year from now, it's like 103 and steadily goes down, 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 down and it's 30 years. Terrible. It's like the totally opposite. Terrible. But yeah, you're didn't seeing, split. you have seen this since, <laughs> you know, since January, though. It, it's it's really like level on out, right? Which is what you want to see, yep. you know, before right. you actually buy and try to catch a fallen knife here. But yeah, I hear you. This is, yeah, this is a falling knife, and um, you know there are some some reasons to think about the falling knife as when it's finally on the floor. Is it time to pick it up? And that's what that right. That's what it looks like. The knife is on the floor right now, although there's still a lot of blood around it. The fact is that um, that's an interesting place to 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 be. I think, and there's I, th I think that right now another thing we talked about on the disciplined investor. Two things. One, uh, last week or the week before that, uh, after we talked about the the caring about your money and mm -hmm. loving your money and the money will love you, was the idea of diversification. I think it's extraordinarily important right now, has not been over the last two, two, three years. And the, and the other thing that's really important is watching your concentration risk. Everybody was piling into this, into that, into the you know areas, right? Everybody's moving, shaking into energy now this year. Everybody's piling in there, pile into tech and mega cap tech for a long period of time. And, and oftentimes that is a recipe to do one of two things. A very high concentration will either create great wealth or create great poverty. Mm -hmm. So think about that when you are setting up your portfolio, that it may be a good time that diversification is kind of 
coming back into the fold as we're seeing this uh, various markets around the world. Some are tightening, some are loosening, some are doing a lot of different things. We have headwinds. I mean, we could name, we could sit here for the next hour, talk about all the headwinds. And there's not a lot of tailwinds. You know, you say diversify and it's such a crazy world where, I mean, we saw this market pull back. Uh, where was a safe haven? It wasn't gold. It wasn't Bitcoin. Also pulled back. It, it was, yeah. You know, even some Alts. of these large caps pulled back. A couple of them, you know. But it's just, right. it's amazing what you think. Uh, like the some safe haven was the value, it's value side and alts. That was pretty much the safe haven. REITs kind of came in, but not terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it was clearly the 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 value side. The banks didn't pull in at all. I mean, a little bit, but nothing major. What yeah, really pulled in was all yeah. the stuff. They're yeah. off their highs, but they're not down 15, 20 percent. No, no, no. Like, like no, some no. of these other plays. No, no, no. So, but yeah, I agree with you. Place. It's either all in, all out. Yeah, it is amazing how everything's. That's why Bitcoin was such a, you know, at least from an investment bank perspective, where they're forced to get in because it's a two trillion dollar market and their clients want it. So now that everyone's getting it and hiring like crazy in crypto within these banking divisions. But right. yeah, it was supposed to be something that's not correlated to everything else, and then you sort of, you know, really come down along with everything else. So it's kind of, you know, diversity. <laughs> exactly. it, it's not the easiest thing, but it's Andrew, not easy. It, it, you gave us some ideas. You always give us ideas. Love having you on. We can go anywhere, you know, the economy, sports, whatever you want. But um, I will ask you this. What is your Super Bowl prediction with Cincinnati and the Rams uh, before we go here? But uh, yeah, do you have any prediction there? Yeah, I'm the wrong guy to ask. <laughs> I'll say my steak, will, my, steak will be, my steak will be medium rare. Go Frank Curzio, go. How's that? <laughs> That's perfect. And you might be the best guy to ask because I do this thing every year. And saying it's the greatest trade of all time because I am wrong. I'll pick it, I'll analyze it, and I'm wrong every single year. So, uh, so yeah, I'm not I, the right I, guy. I, I'll enjoy it. I will drink. I will eat. You know, a little mm. bit less this year than usual. Um, yeah. Have some good time, good barbecue with friends, and I'll enjoy the game. And uh, you know, halftime, uh, okay. But I, I, I much, and it's going to be a lot of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies on the halftime this year. That I'll give you. Yeah, that the commercials and the halftime show should be pretty good with all with. Uh, and we'll be disappointed with the game as usual. Yeah, hopefully it's not. The players have been good so far. Hopefully uh right. carry over. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, learn more about your business, how can they do that? So go over to the disciplinedinvestor.com. Just look up Andrew Horowitz. You'll find me all over the place. Uh, uh, you could just do that on that thing called, I think it's called Google something or some kind of internet Just thing. look me up. You're going to find me everywhere. I love that. Uh, Even uh, just look up my like name. That. Even though you didn't say yeah, that. Just, but yeah. I, here you go. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You got the, oh, there you go. That was a good one. Yeah, that was a good that was a good show, actually. Uh, shallow <laughs> Hal investing. Uh, but yeah, just to go over to the Discipline Investor. Uh, you could go on to Apple Podcasts or any of the other podcast places that are out there, Spotify, um, Amazon, et cetera. Find the DH Plug podcast, the Discipline Investor podcast, the books, the audio book on uh, Audible, as well this as we manage right money. Here. That's what we actually do. Frank that Curzio. Guy? That good looking guy. Yep. Yeah. Frank Curzio. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm bringing up his, his uh, past podcast guests. I like the way you display this, though. It's pretty cool. Very easy. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome stuff. Well, Andrew, as always, thank you so much for coming on. Love having you on. I always say this after every one of our interviews that we both say, so we have to get together soon. I am going to be in your neck of the woods in the next couple of weeks. I'm promising that I'm going to stop by. Come on. We're going fishing. This week coming up this Saturday is a fishing tournament. I'm in know, for sale fish. Come on down, Frank. Pictures. Hate him. You, you text Come on me down, Frank. All the time. I'm like, shit. So I definitely will. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> and uh, listen, but we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Frank. You're the best. All right. Take care, buddy. All right, guys. So uh, great stuff from Andrew. Love having him on. And now here comes the fun stuff, which is my Super Bowl prediction. So the Super Bowl prediction, I just mentioned it with Andrew that it's basically me breaking down this game. I'm the biggest football fan in the world. I've been in fantasy football leagues for, man, 35, 40 years. That's how old I am now. I uh, had Ebbett Smith. We used to look at box scores in the newspapers. That's how long ago <laughs> I used to wait for the paper to come out to see, especially, uh, you know, you see the stats on uh, – you know, prime time and stuff, but not all of them for all your players, right? So, uh, you know, we used to look at the paper and the Daily News and the Post and, and look at the box scores and then add them up, like, by hand to see if you won. So that's how long I've been in. But the, the long-standing joke with Super Bowl is, you know, just bet against me because usually I'll break it down and make a lot of sense, and then, you know, I always lose. So I think out of the last 10 years, I lost twice. I would say really nine times. The other time, I think it was two years ago, I did, when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, I had that one. And this is with the spread as well. And... uh Before that was the Eagles. 
But the Eagles are my favorite team, and I actually went to that Super Bowl. It was the greatest Super Bowl ever. Ever. I'm not being biased. Ever. That was amazing. That was. I had great seats. I was right right there in the 30-yard line for the Philly special right there. Oh, that was amazing. Especially being nervous that Brady was going to, you know, wreck them. They went dug by five and a half that game, and they wound up winning, which is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, but here we go. Okay, so you have the Rams playing Cincy. Uh, Rams favored by four and a half. Over under is 48 and a half. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals, big surprise. They were 125 to one to make Super Bowl at the beginning of the year. Uh, the Rams, one of the favorites, especially signing two superstar players, which was Von Miller and Odell Beckham. Uh, you could argue Odell Beckham's not a Super Bowl, a superstar player anymore, but he's been playing like it lately, right? He's really picked it up. He's got lots of touchdowns, did amazing in, in, in the second half of the year. Uh, the Rams are playing at home, right? It's a big advantage considering you don't have to go anywhere, right? Which which makes sense. And, and you know, you're at home last game. Now you're sitting there, and, and yeah, that's really big. Like the traveling portion, you're familiar with the stadium uh, that worked wonders for Tampa last year. Uh, and Tampa, I think, was the first team to play in the Super Bowl at their home stadium, and this is the second time it's happened two years in a row. Uh, I will tell you an interesting stat though, which I found funny, that the Rams, even though they're home, they're going to be the visiting team. Ah, little trivia at the beginning of the day. Well, maybe a little bit later after a couple of drinks. But they're the visiting team just simply because AFC and NFC rotate that every year. So they're playing at home, but they're going to be the visiting team, which is weird. Let's break it down. You have Stafford, quarterback of the Rams, who is great. Uh, Interesting stat. They say he had uh, 34 fourth quarter comebacks in the regular season, fifth most in NFL history. However, he played for the Detroit Lions, and they were down probably in 85% of those games. So I don't really look too high on that stat. I mean, getting into the fourth quarter, they're probably down in almost every one of their games. Uh, so they had plenty of chance to come back compared to, you know, Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers or, you know, Brady at New England, who that team is mostly up, right, going into the fourth quarter because they win a lot of their games. But he did throw close to 5,000 yards this year, 41 TDs. Those are amazing numbers. On the other end, Joe Burrow, basically a rookie. Got hurt last year. Amazing talent. I think he's going to be the next great quarterback in the NFL. Uh, you know, and you can say that for a lot. You can say that for... for you know, the quarterback for uh, Josh Allen. Uh, man, there's just so many great, great quarterbacks right now. I mean, of course, you got, you know, Kansas City with Mahomes. Uh, even the guy for, from San Diego is great. Uh, so, you know, you have a lot of really great quarterbacks, upcoming talent right now. Uh, but I think Joe Burrow just has something special. But, yeah, here's a guy that won on every level. Uh, Cincinnati has a great offense. They got Jamar Chase, uh, most electrifying wide receivers, most reception yards, TDs by a rookie in Bengals history. They also have T. Higgins, who's an awesome receiver. Uh, and then they got Tyler Boyd, who's amazing, who's an unbelievable wide receiver. Uh, and he's the third best on their team, which tells you, you know, how good that wide receiving core is. And then you have Joe Mixon running back, who has always been pretty good, but this year, really, really good, really solid. Uh, doesn't fumble the ball much. Just great, great year. Uh, offensive line is okay. I'm lying. Their offensive line actually allowed the most sacks this year in the NFL. <laughs> so Joe Burrow could be blamed for half of those because here's a guy who doesn't really get rid of the ball too much. Uh, not like, you know, you never really see Brady get sacked often, right? Because he just gets rid of it, gets rid of it, gets rid of it. Joe Burrow tries to create a little bit and it results in, you know, again, this is the NFL. You can't hold the ball longer than three and a half seconds, four seconds. You're done, right? So it's like more like three seconds. Uh, on the other end, you have the Rams, who also have some firepower on offense. Cooper Cuff, best receiver in the world right now. Unbelievable. And the triple crown. That's the most receptions, yards, TD catches as a wide receiver. Very hard to do. Uh, almost had 2,000 yards receiving this year. That's an insane number. I think it was Randy Morris, I think, is the only person to ever do that. It's either him or, or Johnson from, from Detroit. But unbelievable. Like, just 2,000 is incredible. Odell Beckham, really playing his best football right now. Confident, uh, amazing. And then Van Jefferson is a huge deep threat. One of the most underrated wide receivers in the NFL. Uh, Cam Akers is the running back. He is good, but he had some fumbling issues. And then you have Sonny Michel, who was on a Super Bowl team for New England. Uh, that's the backup. I wouldn't say that's the strength of running game. But, you know, they have such good wide receivers, good quarterback, uh, and pretty good offensive line that... You know, they, they do a good job running the ball, but just not their special. If they can run the ball, it's going to be a, 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 a long day for Cincy. Let's see. Um, I would give the slight offensive edge to Cincy. Slight, maybe a tie. Defense, though, different story. I mean, Rams are superior. Aaron Donald may be the best player in all of football. Then you have Von Miller, who they just signed, just amazing pass rushers. You know, that, they're just great. Jalen Ramsey, one of the best covers in the world. He said he wants to guard Jamar Chase. He's probably going to be on Jamar Chase. Eric Weddle is solid, older. 
used to be lights out playing safety. Actually, though, they needed some help and injuries, and he just came out of retirement. So I think they might be a little bit weak there. The Bengals do have Trey Herrickson, uh, Sam Hubbard, uh, and you know, just a great line. They have uh, uh, Jesse Bates, one of the best safeties, and who I predict is going to have an interception in this game. Great pass rushers, also solid corners. I love those guys are great pass rushers. But the Bengals D hasn't been electrifying this year, but they really, really played well against the Titans. And they were one of the best games, defensive games I've seen. I mean, they really shut down Kansas City in that second half. I mean, they were down like three touchdowns. So so they're coming in red hot with a lot of confidence. When I look at this game, everything, everything points to a Rams blowout. I'm hearing that from everybody. Rams are going to blow them out. They're going to blow them out. They're at home, you know, since he's lucky to be there, they shouldn't have been there. Uh, they're young. You know, just they're, McVay's a better coach on the ranch. Just, you're hearing that a lot. And look, the offensive line is better for the Rams. The D is better. More experience at quarterback. Top 10 in some of the most important statistical categories, like ninth in total offense, eighth in scoring, fifth in passing offense, 10th in takeaways, third in sacks. I mean, those are stats that are meaningful that usually win championships. However... If you're looking at the Rams, they were also seventh in giveaways. The Rams and Stafford really got lucky to be here. They were winning games, and I felt like they choked at the end of those games, and they got lucky. Uh, you're looking, and, and I know Stafford came and scored that touchdown at the end, but they gave the, they gave the game to, to Tampa. Tampa just didn't take it. It was very, very you know, if that would have went to overtime, uh, it would have been crazy. Uh, you're looking at... at the San Francisco game, Stafford threw just a duck up, a lob that, seriously, my daughter would have caught very easily, and the guys just dropped it. That would have gave the 49ers the ball in the fourth quarter with the lead. Instead, the next play was a 35-yard pass to Beckham, and then he got hit in the head, and that was an extra 15 yards, So, and then they wound up scoring. So, you know, a lot could have changed if a guy could have caught a lob that just fouled this guy, and he missed it, and he dropped it because Stafford threw a bad pass, and Stafford has a habit of throwing lots and lots of bad passes. He's good for one to two interceptions a game. Uh, he should have gotten intercepted a lot more, and he did. He did get intercepted a lot this year. So um, when I look at McVay, great offensive mind, but I'm not sold on him either. I feel like he's not that great of an overall coach. There's great offensive uh, minds. There's great defensive minds. But as a coach, I have no idea, even you know, watching him in the past couple of years, but especially even the last game at San Francisco, they used all their timeouts. They had no timeouts that they going into the fourth quarter, which I've never seen in an NFL game in a very, very long time. Uh, and it was a tight game. It was a tight game that San Francisco was leading. And again, they could have got that ball if they got the ball. They had no timeouts left. They would have ran off a ton of clock. And if they could just run the ball a little bit, that game would have been over. Rams would have lost. Uh, they got lucky. And it was because you challenged two plays that were absolutely ridiculous that everyone knew that you shouldn't have challenged. So, you know, and I don't know if it was coaches, they have to tell him to challenge or whatever. It's just, I'm not sold on him. Uh, but that leads me to Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow last year in a game against the Eagles, which they tied, which is sad, <laughs> tying the NFL, he got hit by one of the Eagles after throwing the ball and thought there was a flag. So he looked no flag, didn't complain, but he went to, I think it was Graham who hit him. And he looked at him, and, and one of the refs heard as well, and he goes, you know what? When I'm the GOAT, greatest of all time, I'm going to get that call. <laughs> That's when he was a rookie. And then he got hurt, right? And he was out, and now, you know, this year, unbelievable year. Burrow's one of those guys that doesn't know how to lose. Uh, how he won that Chiefs game was absolutely incredible. And they were, they, were, they were done, right? And yes, the D was great, but they were down three TDs, and he had to come back and, and score for them, and he did. Uh, he got sacked nine times against the Titans, nine times against the Titans, which is a record in playoffs. Uh, he still threw for 350 yards and won that game. He has to be smart, no stupid turnovers, throw the ball away instead of being sacked because Donald and Miller are going to be in your face, so three-step drops, quick throws. Uh, but unlike the Rams who crawled into the Super Bowl, the Bengals actually went out there and won that game against the Titans, which had their full squad, right? Their, their running back came back, the full squad. Uh, the Chiefs, they won that game too at their stadiums away, which is really hard to do, right? So the Rams had, had that home, you know, field advantage all the way through, and they still have it now. I feel like the Bengals are coming in with nothing to lose, much more relaxed, uh, much more than McVay and Donald who were predicting last game, we got to win, we got to win. And again, they almost blew that game. They actually should have lost that game if that guy intercepted the ball. Uh, it's just, you know, you're winning and you look great and you came back. But San Francisco was up a lot. And then, you know, again, it, it's... For me, when I'm looking at the Rams, they don't know how to be dominant. 
and, and you need to be dominant. You need to put your foot on their throat, which New England does, right? When you have the ball two minutes left and the other team has three timeouts, you know, you got idiots that hand the ball off three times and then, you know, you'll give it back to Brady and Brady will score a touchdown. Or you have to, you know, look at New England, uh, um, where they had Brady. They'll throw the ball once or twice because, you know, one first down automatically ends the game, right? You put your foot on the throat, you end it. You don't give them a shot. And I don't see that with the Rams. Uh, I'm also looking at Stafford, who is, I think he's going to throw at least two picks in this game. Uh, he, I'm pretty sure he led the league, led the league in interceptions this year uh, because he just takes, throws a lot of crazy passes, which, you know, I think he's going to do. And, you know, forcing the issue. when they, If they play conservative, they could win. If they're running the ball, it could get really ugly. I admit it could get ugly. But with the four and a half, I like the Bengals. I actually think the Bengals have a shot to win outright 31-24. Uh, so take the Bengals with four and a half points. Uh, I have Jefferson, some other bets. Jefferson, wide receiver for the Rams, scoring the first TD. I also have Stafford throwing at least two picks. Uh, again, you know, those fourth quarter comeback stats, you know, they, it's very, very overrated statistic when you're playing for a team that's always, always behind in the fourth quarter. Uh, but when you look at the interceptions, that's what scares me. One last thing here. Other than make sure you watch the Super Bowl Halftime show, because that I have a feeling that's going to be one of the best halftime shows where you have Snoop Dogg, Dre, you're going to have uh, Eminem, and I think they're going to bring on so many, so many great people. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be really exciting. But the last thing I'm going to say, which, by the way, with my prediction, it means that you should definitely, definitely, definitely put your house, just put everything you can on the rims. <laughs> that's why I do this and poke fun at it. We'll poke fun at it next week when I do lose. But um, Mattress Jack... Mattress Jack is a Texas furniture salesman who bets Super Bowl. He bets millions of dollars in Super Bowl. He won last year. I'm not sure what he did the year before, but he bet on Tampa Bay with the points, and he won. This year, he put a $4.5 million bet, record bet, on Cincy to win outright, which will net him $7.7 million because you're getting odds on that because, you know, he's not taking the points. He places at Caesars uh, Sportsbook where he said, the Caesars is the only one with big enough britches <laughs> to take that kind of bet at a single time. So he runs Gallery Furniture, located in Houston, and he's running a special promotion for his customers to spend $3,000 or more on furniture. Uh, again, very successful uh, company, very successful guy. And he said the Bengals, when he wins his bet, Mattress Mac will use his winnings to reimburse the full amount of all the customer's purchases. That's pretty freaking cool. That's a very, very big bet. Again, he won last year. I'm not too sure what his record is before that. I think, you know, like two or three Super Bowls I've seen him bet. Uh, but that's a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money to put on Cincinnati uh, to win outright. So um, he did win last year. That was a bet of three point four million that he won, and this time he's going four point five, one of the biggest bets, and it's going to say one of the biggest betting Super Bowls of all time. Like Andrew said, you're going to see lots of commercials when it comes to uh, cryptocurrencies. I think there's three or four different companies that 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 have taken out you know commercials and stuff. So it should be pretty cool. It should be overall a fun Super Bowl. But I do have the Bengals winning outright. 31-24 of the Rams, which means you should take the Rams. So that's my prediction. Take it for what it's worth. And that's it for me. So questions, comments from me at frank at curzioresearch.com. I want to thank Andrew again for coming on. You guys that want any information on our security token, which we launched Curzio Equity Owners on Monday, which is an exciting event for our company. You can go uh, and trade that token only on a T0 exchange, but there's other exchanges that are open and starting to trade t uh, security tokens. We're very early into this trend. And, and again, there's a reflection of the equity stake in our company. Uh, which we're very, very excited about. So I know I'm still getting lots of questions on how to do that. You can go to T0. Again, they don't pay me to say that. It's just the only place where you could trade our token. And it's, you know, on day one was a huge success for us. Again, I can't talk about the stock price, but um, I will say that we had more volume on that day than we had almost an entire year on the foreign exchange that we traded on. So, uh, you know, really exciting stuff. And that's what I want to do. I want to be able to bring this to, you know, this kind of service, uh, this equity, you know, it, it's something different, uh, but I think it's going to change the future. It's going to be the future of finance. It's going to change the investment banking industry. It's just great for us, great for investors and get in early on small companies and lots of things. There's hundreds of trillions of assets that could be tokenized. You're going to see a lot of that come to fruition over the next decade, starting now. And that's why you're seeing places like Gemini, major platform, Winklevoss Twins, getting into security tokens, launching a platform. You're seeing that uh, Coinbase has those licenses and more and more of these are going to open up because there's going to be more stringent rules on these utility tokens, which are absolutely securities and the sec will rule on that sooner or later when they do that's when you really see a boom in security tokens which provide much more transparency and also like ours you get an actual equity stake just like you would be buying a stock 
uh, in our company. So it's based on me and growing this company and hopefully we can continue to do that thanks to your help and word of mouth and stuff like that and uh, doing a great job. Love the team and I just want to say appreciate everything. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Have lots of beers, drinks, have fun. Whatever you do, smoke a joint. I don't care. Just enjoy it. Don't talk politics and uh, hopefully you get to spend time with your friends and family and I'll be here for you. Analyzing stocks, busting my ass and I'll see you guys next week. Take care.